What's DQ dp? So this becomes one over epsilon sub naught pi. And my area here does not change with time. So I'm basically going to sort of throw that on the inside of the derivative, just like you can take a constant out, you can put a constant in. And so this becomes d times the area times the electric field, which is the electric flux, dd. Which is, oops, my subscript there. So I have epsilon sub naught, d phi e d. So I have a current here, but remember what current is. It's, it's been moving charge. I don't have any moving charge in between here. This charge, this current right here, is because I have a change in my electric field in between here, which cause, is caused by a change in the charge on the plates. I put in a negative charge here, a negative charge leaves. A negative charge is displaced from the, the positive plate. So this is called the displacement current. So we have a different type of current here. With the, before we've dealt with current, it's been a moving charge. Now we have a changing electric field. Bring back Ampere's law. Ampere's law says that around some closed loop, B dot DL is equal to mu dot I. That's Ampere's law. But if I have two different types of current, this current is dealing with the moving charge, but I have this other current dealing with the changing electric field. And so I can expand that to I plus I sub D. So we have the more traditional current, and then we have this displacement current. So that's mu naught I plus mu naught I sub D. And I sub D is just written around there somewhere. There we go. It's written right there. This is mu naught I plus Epsilon sub naught, mu sub naught, change in electric flux, dt. So we can now bring together four horsemen of electromagnetism. My electric flux around the through a closed surface is equal to an enclosed charge over epsilon sub naught, or epsilon is through a dielectric. Energy. The magnetic flux through any closed surface is equal to zero. The magnetic field, basically a line integral of a magnetic field is equal to mu naught times I plus mu naught epsilon sub naught d phi e dt. And then uh, I guess I didn't fully do this one, but this is the electric field around the closed loop. This is the induced EMF is equal to negative d phi d dt. This is Maxwell's equations. Where this, and, and uh, you can piece together things we've done in the past, this is the EMF, the induced EMF. Notice the parallels here. We've got an E dot dA, B dot dA, B 
dot dl, e dot dl. Because we can have electric monopoles, in other words, charges, it's equal, not, it's equal to something other than zero, but we can't have magnetic, we, there are no magnetic monopoles that have been found. And then we have some relationship to the change in the magnetic flux and the uh, sorry, electric flux and the change in the magnetic flux. This is part of the speculation that because there's sort of, because we've got parallels going on here, this is where they come up with you know magnetic monopoles, which we then put in another term down here. And so the theory, the, the cap formulas are already written. They're just waiting to find a magnetic monopole. But more importantly, the implications of this. I have a charge here. The electric field goes away from it. I then move the charge to here. So imagine that you were sitting at a point here. What can you tell me about the electric field at that green dot when the charge moves from left to right? In general terms, not looking for any, anything real deep here. Uh, close enough. It's going to change. The electric field is point, was pointing in that direction, and then it's later pointing in that direction. My electric field changes. If there's a change in my electric field, that means that there's a change in my electric flux. If there's a change in my electric flux, that means I'm going to create a magnetic field. So I have this and I just moved it over there. And then I move it back. Matter of fact, I'm just going to keep doing that. I'm going to start with this charge here and I'm just going to move it back and forth. So my electric field is changed, constantly changing. So if my electric field changes, so I'm going to have a change in the change of my electric field because it starts going this way and then it goes that way and then it comes back that way. So my electric field not only is it changing, but it, the changing is changing which means that I'm going to have a change in the change in my electric field, which means I'm going to have a change in my magnetic field. If I have a change in my magnetic field, that means I have a change in my magnetic flux, which is going to create an electric field. If I am truly oscillating this thing back and forth, uh, I'm going to have change, 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 change. Ooh, I have a change in my electric field. Wait a second, that's gonna create a change in my electric flux, which is gonna create a change in my magnetic field, which will create a change in my magnetic flux, which will create an electric field, which is, but if I'm constantly changing, then all of this is changing all the time. So all I have to do is get it started, and I have an electric field and a magnetic field that suddenly are self-propagating. By changing the magnetic field creates a change in the electric field, which creates a change in the magnetic field, which creates a change in the electric field. <clears throat> this is the source of electromagnetic radiation. Probably wait till next Tuesday to do the full derivation, so I'm going to jump to some of the chase on this one. What we will derive next Tuesday is Maxwell recognized this piece right here, and he recognized the implications, the fact that you would have this electric field and magnetic field propagating each other. And so I thought, well, let's see if we can calculate how fast that thing's going. Yes, Lawson. Put it into words. How would you like? How would you define electromagnetic radiation? Electromagnetic radiation is radiation.
caused by photons where the electric field and magnetic field self-propagate. They, the change in one creates a change in the other, which creates a change back. Similar in some respects to uh, the magnet over the, the superconducting material, the fact that it moves causing a current which causes it to be pushed back, which then stops and then this just constantly vibrates very subtly. Is that sufficient? So Maxwell tries to figure out the speed, and so he comes up with a formula, one over the square root of u sub naught on epsilon sub naught. So we can actually calculate that because that's the square root of 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And if you do that, what do you get? Point nine nine times ten to the eighth, I think. Even this. Do I do it the hard way? This is a uh, tesla meter squared per ampere, and this is. Uh, Uh, the classic unit is uh, the square root of tesla meter squared coulomb squared per ampere. Oh, wait, no. Gets flipped. So that would be ampere newton meter squared per tesla meter squared coulomb squared. So the meter squared cancel out. So it's ampere newtons over tesla coulomb squared. And the square root of that. The square root of that would be. There's a simple version. Yeah, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Meters per second. Yeah, it's speed. Gotcha. <laughs> Although the other one, I mean, the square root of ampere newtons per tesla coulomb squared is a legitimate unit of speed. However, it's not the one that people usually use. Okay. All right, so Maxwell saw this and he goes, wait a second. That's really close to the speed of light. Now, a question might come up of how do you have to calculate the speed of light? Maxwell's doing this in the 1870s. 60s, 70s, 70s, 70s. The first attempt that I know of of trying to find the speed of light was done by Galileo. He basically figured reflexes, human reflexes would be about the same, and so he had Somebody standing on one hill, he was on another hill, and so that person would flash a light, and then Galileo would flash a light back, and they time how long it took for the person to flash the light for the, them to see the signal coming back. Figured that you do that at different distances, do a little graph, you got the, the speed of reflexes, figuring that's about the same every single time, and he came up with the conclusion that if light is not infinitely fast, it's very, very fast. Then came some more technology, and they found the speed of light by basically shining light against mirrors. And so they had this wheel with prongs in it all the way around. And they shine light through between two of them, they hit a mirror, and then the light comes back. You start cranking this, and at first the light's going to be going out, coming back through the same hole, at some point you're going to block the light because by the time the light gets back here, this is now covering it up. And then you, and then you keep cranking it faster until 
you see the light again, that's when the light goes through this crack right here between those two cogs and comes back between these two. And that's the essence of how it was found experimentally. So they came out, they actually had values of whatever units they were using at the time, but would now translate into about 300 million meters a second. They got more sophisticated uh, as you got better gear ratios. It's easier to get bigger wheels here, as well as you know, more mirrors get the light bouncing farther. So Maxwell, at the end of his paper, says that he suspects, he doesn't make the outright claim, he suspects that light is an electromagnetic wave. And it turns out he's right. However, the controversy. Maxwell comes out with this, and for the next 30 years, physicists are going, there's something missing. So the question I'm asking you is, what is missing from this formula that would make physicists think something's wrong? Mild hint, uh, Einstein was the one who realized that Maxwell was not wrong. Or at least he's the one who pursued it. Uh, no, not a force issue. I'm guessing this comes up in special relativity? It does. Which is typically why, uh, for the first couple of years I was teaching this course, as soon as we got to this point, immediately went into relativity until one of the students uh, went off to NC State to do electrical engineering and then sent word back of, it really would have been nice had we not skipped AC circuits. And so that's why we will do AC circuits uh, now. So we won't, we'll touch on relativity here, do AC circuits, and then come back to relativity. All right, so let me ask you a question, another question. How fast are you moving right now? Relative to what? Okay, so it's missing a frame of reference. And then Lorentz was probably the biggest advocate of Maxwell made a mistake. Jump through hoops to try to explain why it's not showing up here. Because it's ridiculous to think you don't need a frame of reference. Einstein comes along and says, no, you don't need a frame of reference. The speed of light in a vacuum is the same regardless of how fast you're moving. I go 100 miles per hour down the highway, light is hitting me at that speed. Because light was there before you. I had thought about it that way. Not all light, I would say. Mm -hmm. I'm traveling near the speed of light. Light's still traveling this fast. If I had a, some detector to measure the speed of light, it would measure that. I'm at rest sitting on the earth and I pull out my detector. I'm still getting the exact same speed. It'd be a heck of a speeding ticket. <laughs> Recognize the huge implication of why this was so disturbing to physicists. The thought experiment. I have a mirror up here and I have a box down here that's going to emit light. I got two frames of reference. I got the lab frame. In the lab frame, this box is moving at some speed v. It shines the light up. The light basically has a, a component in that direction. So the light is basically going to hit here, and then it's going to hit the box over here. So as the box moves, it shines the light from its point of view up. So the light has a sideways component as well as a vertical component. In the box frame, The light goes up and comes back. Mm -hmm. Now, speed is distance divided by time. If the speed of the light is the same, what is the implication? Okay. 
Well, I was thinking in terms of distance. Light travels farther in which frame? Left, to left frame. But the speed's the same, therefore. Say again, Precious? The time's the same. The time is the same. Ooh. If this is a bigger distance than that is, and the ratio is the same. Oh. The time is less. Time's less. The last frame is less. Time is definitely not the same. Time is not a constant. And that was why it was so disturbing. If you've been doing experiments all your life, dependent upon time, and suddenly someone says, wait a second, your time is not necessarily the same as someone else's time. Now fortunately, for every, almost every experiment done on Earth, time is pretty much the same. One second here is one second pretty much everywhere. But there are some subtle differences. Probably the most glaring example of the fact that Time is not the same as in GPS satellites. A GPS satellite is traveling in orbit at a particular speed. It is traveling faster than we are relative to the Earth. Its time is different. Matter of fact, if we did not take into account this idea that time is not the same, the GPS satellites would be off, I think it's uh, 30 meters a day. We'll calculate it out. There's a general relativity aspect and a special relativity aspect um, the general relativity aspect, uh, I just have to sort of nod when I read it, go, yeah, I'll we'll trust that they're telling me the truth. The special relativity aspect, we can actually get, calculate, we will at some point. So if you run to class, it turns out, if you run to class, time is traveling more slowly for you than if you walk to class. Now, we will derive this, again, time. <laughs> that, thing, that thing pretty much says it all right there. Uh, this P right here, this stands for proper time. My proper time is if I had a watch out, like a stopwatch and I started it, and 10 seconds passed by, that's my proper time. It's not yours, it's mine. So is that symbol in front of it some kind of time constant? This is known as the Lorentz transformation. The guy who wanted to show that Maxwell was wrong. Lorentz came so close to discovering special relativity, just refused to believe that time was different. Stubborn physicist. Yeah, and you know, like, Potentially a comment about the arrogance of physicists, Lorentz basically is a classic. And I wish I could remember the names. There was these, there were these two physicists that Lorentz basically crushed as much as he could. He just completely disbelieved them. And they turned out to be right. I can't remember the names. They ended up being Nobel Prize winners. Uh, but Lorentz was that kind of a-hole. All right. I'm sure he was very nice to his family, but the physicists. All right. So this Lorentz transformation is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. c is the speed of light, that constant. And v is how fast the object is moving. Now, this comes out of the mathematics. This is the case where the math drives the ideas. What happens if v equals c? No, it's one minus, yeah. So I get one minus one, which yeah. is zero, mm -hmm. which makes the whole thing. So, because this pops out, V can't be seen. An object that is starting out slower than the speed of light cannot get to the speed of light. It will never get there. That's improved. 
there is but oh experimental evidence to support that. There's some other implications. We will talk next week or potentially the week after about the, the famed muon experiment, as if I need to say more about that, which is basically the first major piece of evidence to support special relativity. Does it, aren't muons kind of like uh, more dense matter? Say it again? Aren't muons like oh, hyper dense or something? No, muon is just another subatomic particle. Yeah. Thing. It's a different combination of quarks. Okay. Uh, but also, so they come to this, so anything starting out slower than the speed of light cannot get to the speed of light. The math won't allow it. And then experiment does back it up. And then someone comes along and says, wait a second, what about if something starts out faster than the speed of light? It can never go slower. It, it, it's a barrier there. And so there's a whole bunch of physics that's around particles that potentially can travel faster than the speed of light. Like tachyons. Exactly. Now, tachyons are a funky kind of thing because uh, of the way defined gets, time gets defined here. If you got shot by a tachyon gun in our, so in our reality, as we observe things, if you got shot by a tachyon gun, you would be hit before the trigger is pulled. Wait, what? Yeah, because uh, there's a whole lot of stuff with uh, light speed stuff like uh, the reason why light speed ships can't exist is that you would arrive before you left and all that. Yeah. So if tachyons ever actually do get found, uh, we need to sort of redefine what time is. So yeah. anyway, there's I think Trevor you were about to say something. So we can't re so if the theory is right that we can't reach the speed of light does that mean that we could get as close to it as possible? And we, we can get part of, they have to be small enough. I mean, so we get electrons and protons up to near the speed of light, like 0.999 times the speed of light. So we can't get really close to it. And if all the stuff that will eventually derive comes true, those, those predictions seem to be coming out and we'll get into the experimentation. Uh, we will not do the high energy experiments. But this says it's not high energy experiments to do. They take light particles like protons and electrons, they zip them up near the speed of light, and then they smash them into things. Can you just get a particle accelerator in here? I actually looked at trying to build one um, <laughs> because there have been people who have built particle accelerators in the garage. The first guy who, that I read about did it, uh, ended up dying of radiation poisoning. Uh, there was another guy who did it who took more safety precautions and actually got help from the local university as opposed to buying questionable radioactive materials from people who just happened to fall, find some bullet off the back of a Russian truck. And so... Wouldn't it involve a lot of magnets? Yeah, the... Well... You can, with a random graph generator high-powered enough, you can actually shoot the electrons at things. You can, you can, oh, okay. Now, how fast you can get them, I'm not 100% sure. The trouble is, is if I take an electron and I fire it at something, mm -hmm. it's a charge, moving charge, I have a constant magnetic field, everything's sort of fine with, or it creates a magnetic field, but it hits something that stops very quickly. Suddenly, we get a huge change in the electric field, a uh, huge change in the current, huge change in the electric field, and we suddenly get this pulse of radiation, which happens to be potentially cancer causing. And so that's the danger of, that when I got to that point, I thought, yeah, I, I don't need to pursue this anymore. <laughs> it's not worth it. No. It would have been cool to have our own particle accelerator, but yeah, um, yeah there's that death thing that I'm still going to do. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful evening, a good, a good morrow, and 